Introducing Themes ETFs. Our ETFs seek to provide a way to own the opportunities that are shaping the future and moving markets. With expense ratios 40% cheaper than the average charged by our competitors. All right, welcome everyone. This is ETF.com's Exchange Traded Fridays podcast, a weekly podcast covering developments in the ETF industry. My name is Jeff Benjamin. I'm Wealth Management Editor here at ETF.com. This week, we're talking to Taylor Kriskoviak, Vice President and Investment Strategist at Themes ETFs, a brand new ETF issuer that we're going to hear all about. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for the warm welcome, Jeff. It's been a great pleasure to be here with you today. Looking forward to our chat. All right, I am too. Let's get right into it here. Uh, tell us about Themes ETFs. You entered the ETF business just last month with 11 funds. Absolutely. Appreciate the question. As you mentioned, we are a brand new issuer in the space and really excited to bring to market a number of different strategies that span a fairly wide breadth, everything from cutting edge technologies like artificial intelligence, cloud computing, cybersecurity, to traditional industries like airlines, banks, European luxury, and also some funds focusing on fundamental factors on the balance sheet, things like high free cash flow, things like natural monopolies, those firms that have pricing power in their respective markets. But not only are we excited about the breadth of strategies that we brought to market, but also the price point that we brought, which mm -hmm. we have strive to bring those funds at a very competitive price point, really trying to drive down those fees that we've seen in the thematic space that have been relatively expensive when we take a look at some of the lower cost alternatives available in some other index ETFs. Yeah. Yeah, we're we're I want to talk about that, the, your your innovation and your fees in a minute. But first let's let's hear about your background, Taylor. I mean, this is a it's got to be a new job for you unless you were the only one there before they they started this company, right? How'd you get into this uh, this ETF business? When we take a look at what really brought me here, so very uh, fortunate to have worked very closely with some of my colleagues in my former positions. Uh, we all teamed together along with a former co-founder of Global X. His name is Jose Gonzalez Navarro. He is our CEO and really excited to start themes uh, over the course of this last year. Really, uh, I fell into the ETF world by virtue of being interested, I think, in financial markets. To me, they're one of the quintessential unsolvable equations, a million constantly changing variables, very few constants. And I've really enjoyed the mental challenge that markets have provided. They tend to be extraordinarily dynamic, surprising, even the most tried and true veterans. They have a way to keep you on your toes keep you very much invested in the recent developments. Uh, there's really never a dull moment in the lack of a better way to put it. I uh, worked uh, in some previous positions, got to cut my teeth as an investment strategy analyst doing macroeconomic research at Raymond James, and then also worked in the derivative space on buffer type investments working for Cibovest before ultimately, again, working with some of my former colleagues to found Dean's ETFs here Sounds like a, a definitely an interesting background. If, and if you want uh, mental challenges, you're probably in the right business. What can you tell us about the funds that were part of the inaugural launch? Obviously, we can't go into every single one of these funds, but you know the company's name is Themes ETFs. That uh, suggests thematic, correct? Yes, they are certainly fulfilling that traditional definition of thematic investments. Uh, so we, again, like I said, kind of span a pretty wide breadth things from the cutting edge technologies, traditional industries. Uh, but we've also incorporated under kind of this themes umbrella, things that would ordinarily be more considered more fundamental strategies. Again, things like uh, cash flow, things like natural monopolies, things like research and development uh, with a profitability overlay. So optimizing some fundamental factors on the balance sheet as well. So we've taken themes not only to mean the traditional men, you know, definition of thematic style investments, but also themes just in general as different opportunity sets in the market, trying to find targeted exposure to certain segments of the market. How have the inflows been so far? I know it's not even been a month or maybe it just has been 30 days, but uh, are, are you seeing the appetite you were hoping for out of the out of the gates? We really are. And a lot of these, as you would expect, some of these thematics, uh, we've seen much more traction in the ones that have been obviously in the headlines. So things right out of the gate are artificial intelligence, 
fund, ticker symbol WISE, WISE, has been the front runner. No surprise there, garnering several million in flows just in our first couple of weeks. Uh, I think we grabbed some headlines by not only being one of the most inexpensive offerings on the market, but as we know, AI continues to dominate the headlines. It's been one of the principal drivers of growth and obviously one of the greatest stories over the last couple of years. So really no surprise there that there's been a significant amount of interest. Uh, even somewhere like our gold miners, ironically, has done very, very well. We launched that fund on the same day that the Federal Reserve announced that it had reached essentially its terminal interest rate and would likely be backing off and perhaps looking into rate cuts. Uh, that has actually been a great boon for those wanting to play the gold space. Uh, again, our gold miners ETF being one of the most inexpensively priced ETFs relative to the competition there. So we've seen several million in flows into that fund as well. Um, so those are, I think, two particular leaders. And again, unsurprisingly, given the environment that we've seen over the couple of weeks, as we know, once we have some more um, track record to, to show and we can see how these funds are getting some more traction depending on the prevalence of a certain theme. Another one, for example, is our bank ETF, uh, ticker symbol GSIB for those global systemically important banks. I know we're leading into banks earnings season on mm -hmm. Friday here, so would, wouldn't be surprised if we saw some more traction, for example, if there is a pickup in the banking sector uh, at the end of this week. Yeah, sounds like some uh, well-timed launches there. But why thematic strategies? I mean, this has not been you know, one of the knock the cover off the ball kind of places to be in the ETF space recently. What opportunities are you are you folks seeing there? So I think it's a fair question that deserves a fair answer and twofold, I think, and really speaks to the value proposition that we hope to provide not only to investors, uh, but to the marketplace as a whole. And namely, we saw that, so to answer your first question, why thematics? When we took a look at the thematic space, we saw that it was a relatively nascent part of the asset management world. And what do I mean by that is that by being in its nascent stage, it had one of the hallmarks of a early part of the asset management industry, namely that fees have remained relatively high. So uh, that average expense ratio calculated by you guys actually on your thematic investing page saw that the average fee charged by most of these funds are about 60 basis points. So obviously, that's a far cry from some of those lower cost ETF options that I think many people have become familiar with in those sort of index strategies. And we thought that this is an opportunity to bring and push forward the thematic space into its next chapter of development, specifically lowering those fees. So that's why we came in and priced our funds very competitively, about 40% below that average at uh, 35 basis points. So that's the first part of, I think, why we chose the thematic space, because we saw an opportunity to provide investors a more competitive price point for those specific sorts of strategies. And then the second part of this question, I think, is market timing. So obviously, we know that thematic strategies, I think, struggled candidly in the 15 years uh, from 2008 to 2022, that period being after the great financial crisis, all the way till when the Federal Reserve and other central banks started to hike interest rates. As we know, that period was dominated by 0% interest rates. And in that sort of zero gravity environment, we saw most assets float upwards, really irrespective of asset class, irrespective of sector. Uh, and you really couldn't go wrong if as long as you were putting your money to work in almost anything, you were doing well. And in some of those broad-based indices, doing extraordinarily well, um, seeing some of those double-digit returns year after year. But now we've seen a pretty significant shift in the space in just the few years since the Federal Reserve started hiking rates beginning in 2022. And this really has given rise to this tale of two markets narrative. And what we've seen in this second iteration of the market is that as those interest rates were hiked, not all stocks, not all sectors are created equal. And interest rates really had a way to bifurcate those stocks and those sectors that could succeed in this environment from those that struggled and were perhaps were not cut out to ultimately perform in this environment. So in that environment, we've actually seen specific targeted parts of the market um, captured by some of these thematic strategies do extraordinarily well relative to these broad-based indices. So again, short answer to your question, I think, is price uh, and also market timing really brings both of those together is in terms of why we thought that we were going to step into the thematic state space at this particular time. 
Okay, Taylor, you make a really strong case for thematics. I'm going to give you that one. All right. But as a newcomer to the ETF space for themes, ETFs, you usually need to be unique or cheap or both in order to stand out. How is themes ETFs going to stand out enough to get the attention of financial advisors? Well, I think to answer your question simply, we strive to be both unique and cheap wherever possible. So I think the the inexpensive prices that we're charging, I think, is the easiest staff to rattle off. Like we said, mm -hmm. um, we're coming in very competitively, 40% below that category average. And just to you know quickly elaborate on that point. So I think it's not only that um, we're cheaper, but we're significantly cheaper by a pretty wide order of magnitude relative to some of these other strategies. Mm -hmm. And in this in market environment where we're likely going to see returns moderate somewhat, um, given the sort of normalized environment that we find ourselves. If we do look at those capital market assumptions going forward, if returns are going to be lower over the next few years than they have been over the last few years, those fees are going to bite deeper into your total return. Um, so, you know, kind of taking a look at what a 1% fee, for example, will do to your overall total return over the course of 20 years in a low rate environment, it's going to start taking a bite to the tune of 30% of your total return in combination with what is being paid towards the fee, as well as the lost opportunity cost of those dollars continuing to be invested in the market and getting exposure to that future growth. And again, that is compounded just mathematically if we take a look at an environment where returns may be lower, um, again, because of this higher interest rate, um, more normalized environment that we may find ourselves on. So I think it's also important to remember that uh, fees matter more, I think, in this environment than they have in years past in that double digit sort of return environment. And in terms of you know how we find ourselves to be unique. We really strive wherever possible to perfect the underlying indices that we've constructed that each one of these strategies track. So wherever possible, building a better product. Uh, when we take a look at some of the rules-based methodologies that we created in developing some of these ETFs, we're trying to give you exposure not only to this theme, uh, but also giving you sufficient diversification. So sufficiently targeted while also being sufficiently diversified. That's one of the things that we found in looking at the space that some of these themes were, were fairly concentrated in just a handful of names. So we tried to, again, retain that sort of targeted exposure while giving you a sufficient amount of diversification, but then also improving wherever possible. So taking, for example, our research and development um, theme. So that's going to be ticker symbol USR for U.S. research and development. It wasn't just enough to pick out research and development companies. We also added a profitability overlay onto that. So it's not only picking research and development companies, it's ones that have actually proven that they can be profitable on their balance sheet. So that's, I think, an example of how we've taken a theme at the broad level, but also overlaid a fundamental factor on the balance sheet to try to give you a targeted exposure that may have the ability to kind of overcome the gravity in this space and may give you some better odds for performance relative to just a R&D theme that doesn't have that same sort of fundamental criteria for a profitability overlay. I'm seeing a lot of talk these days in the ESG space about that kind of category becoming more thematic and less leaning less on those three letters that have become kind of living under a dark cloud over the past few years. Do you see opportunities for an ETF issuer like Themes to find a, maybe an opportunity there in the ESG space? Absolutely. And I think when we take a look at the rise of ESG, I know I did some research on this um, a few years ago, and we were taking a look at ESG ratings when they were first starting to really come into the public consciousness and becoming much more of a present phrase and things like pensions, endowments, and taking a look at where the space was going. There's certainly no lack of appetite, I think, for some competitive ESG investments. One of the greater objections to ESG is saying, okay, great, I can get behind everything that ESG represents, but how is that going to impact my total return? And am I going to be you know, giving up upside in order to attach myself and be ESG compliant in a way that my institution demands? Um, so taking a look at my alma mater, Harvard, for example, um, yeah. big push to try to divest um, from some of those sorts of, uh, you know, either vices you know, or, you know, the other big p p push actually around the time when I was graduating was a big push towards divesting from, you know, carbon 
energy and some of the, you know, a big push to, to kind of get out of the, the big oil space. So again, that's a long way of saying, I think there's a, a continuation of the demand for ESG investments, but one that, that also won't compromise your overall total return. So I think that's a long way of saying that's something that we definitely have in our pretty extensive pipeline at this at this point we only have like you mentioned 11 funds in this inaugural launch but we have quite a few more um, in the pipeline that are going to come out i think over the course of this next year and esg is definitely one that we're taking a look at as a way that we could see if we could also step into that space in a way that makes sense to give you that same sort of exposure um, but optimize for that selection process wherever possible okay with a name like themes are you guys hemmed into just thematic strategies so again, that's where I think that again we're satisfying the thematic definition from its strict denotation. So certainly um, fulfilling the you know again things like artificial intelligence, things that fall squarely in the traditional thematic definition. But we've also taken a, a um, look at what thematic I think means from a connotation perspective when we take a look at you know when we talk about themes in the marketplace in general. And this is where we answer that I don't think we're necessarily pigeonholing ourselves into just thematic strategies, despite the name of our company. We have taken this to really mean themes that are really moving markets and pushing forward the frontier of the future in general. So um, when we take a look at things like derivatives that are going to be definitely um, prominent in our next set of products that are coming out of the pipeline. When we take a look at how can we build a, again, better exposure to a broad-based index uh, while putting a derivative overlay, something like a buy right strategy to give you a total return that can perform in this sort of market environment. We view that also as a theme. So short answer to your question is, Again, we are, I think the, the answer is yes, sticking to some very traditional themes, but also taking uh, a little bit of a, a um, off-road trailblazing approach on the definition of themes to say, these are the things that are kind of powering, you know, innovation and returns in the marketplace in general that are not narrowly defined as themes from the strict denotation of the words. Okay. Uh, and, and kind of getting back to the, uh, the question earlier about being unique, where do you see a niche or opportunity in this environment that is not being served? So one that we saw and we're very excited in this batch of products that we just recently launched, obviously a lot of these names will be familiar to those in the space. Um, obviously there, there, there have been many strategies that are in, you know investing in things like artificial intelligence. We're certainly not the first fund in the space to do so. One of the ones that we did include in this batch, however, was one of the first of its kind and one that we realized that hadn't received the sort of niche exposure up until this point, and that was our banking ETF. So this is one that we constructed around the Global Systemically Important Banks, or GSIB for short. It's also the ticker symbol of the actual fund, GSIB. And this is a term that's used by the Financial Stability Board in defining these 28 publicly traded banks that really form the cornerstone of the entire global financial system, as the name would imply. And trying to unpack that theme a little bit, when we take a look at what happened over the last year, and this is, I think, a really perfect emblematic example of this tale of two markets paradigm, if you will. So when we take a look at what happened to the banking sector over the course of the last year, as they started to digest the impact of the rapid rate increases by the Federal Reserve, we saw that not all banks were made equal in that environment. So when we take a look, this obviously all came to a head in March of 2023, when we saw those incredible collapses of names like Signature uh, bank, Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic Bank, who could not deal and weather the storm ultimately of this environment where interest rates were rising more rapidly than they could accommodate. So we saw the, a pretty obviously extraordinary impact on the small regional banking space, particularly in the United States. Whereas if we take a look at how the larger institutions perform, not only did they remain solvent, but many of those were actually the ones brokering not only these bailouts, but also acquiring some of those assets at what amounts to a pretty significant discount, uh, names like JP Morgan. And when we take a look at how that segment of the market did 
over the course of last year. Uh, JP Morgan, that's about to report its earnings um, this week, is now actually outperforming the S&P over the last year. And I think that was a perfect example of how um, when we take a look at niches and opportunities, this is one where, again, we uh, did not see another ETF that had targeted those 28 global systemically important banks. So that's why we came to market with this ETF, the first of its kind, to give you, again, a more targeted play on the banking industry. Because as we found out over the last year, um, that particular segment of the banking industry not only fared better than the smaller regional banks, but then relative to the banking industry overall, if you were to just have bought a banking sector ETF, for example. Um, so I think that was a nice emblematic example of how we've tried to step in and give you exposure to a particular niche at a time that makes sense in this market environment. Okay. Finally, I want to wrap up here with a question asking what is on deck for themes ETFs? I don't know if you can talk about anything in filing or probably can't talk about things that you're thinking about filing, but maybe you can give us a taste of, of what's to come. Yes, on that front, unfortunately, as we all know, our lips have to be relatively sealed uh, before things are formally filed. The things that I can say, though, is that there is a very, very long list in the pipeline that we're working on bringing to market, um, some sooner rather than later. And again, in that pipeline, as we mentioned, are going to be a breadth of strategies, not only more thematic strategies like the ones that we've launched, but also going to be stepping in quite prominently in the derivative space. This is where I have to give a huge shout out to the head of our product development, Calvin Sang. He was a former colleague of mine at our old shop, um, Cibo Vest, that focused primarily on those derivative strategies. So he has an ex incredible amount of expertise and experience in the derivative space. So keep an eye on some of the filings that we're going to have going forward. I think there are going to be quite a lot of strategies. And ultimately, our hope is to bring, again, a fairly wide breadth of strategies that we're going to have something that's of interest to almost every advisor, every investor, no matter what it is that you're looking for, we're going to have something that I think is going to suit your fancy. And we're going to strive to make that priced at one of the most competitively priced options as well. So now I think that's the one common denominator under all of our strategies is we're going to be coming to market pretty competitively priced relative to the category averages. So really trying to, again, push forward that development and maturity of this space and giving investors that exposure at a more cost efficient proposition. Uh, that's ultimately going to be the value that we try to deliver to investors and to the industry as a whole. All right. Well, I Taylor, I think you just threw down the gauntlet there to the ETF industry. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, we will be definitely watching you and uh, what you guys are coming up with. And please keep us in, in the loop when you guys have stuff, stuff that you can talk about. I want to thank Taylor Chris Koviak, Vice President Investment Strategist at Themes ETFs. And Folks, that's all we have for this episode. You can find this and all other Exchange Traded Friday's episodes at ETF.com or any other podcast platform. See you next week. Introducing Themes ETFs. Our ETFs seek to provide a way to own the opportunities that are shaping the future and moving markets. With expense ratios, 40% cheaper than the average charged by our competitors.